Hello, 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 and welcome back to the IBS Freedom Podcast with a guest. OMG, she is the honored guest that has been on this podcast twice. She's the only one to have that particular honor so far. So let us welcome back Molly Pelletier, RD. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. I guess let's get right down to it. I mean, I, I kind of think of you as the GERD gal or the, you know, stomach upper GI gal, at least out of like the people that I follow and I keep up with. So I'm curious, would you do us all a favor and recap your story a little bit right out the get go? Because you yourself had GERD and struggled with that for a while. Can you share a little bit about your story? Like what did you try that didn't work for you? What ultimately helped you? And then we'll kind of segue into a conversation about GERD after that point. Absolutely. So I started having acid reflux symptoms in undergrad. And for me, in terms of root causes, it was kind of like the perfect storm of chronic stress, under eating, some nutrient deficiencies going on, as well as post antibiotic use and like post infection. So a ton of things going on. And I had super severe GERD. I would, you know, have heartburn, the throat pain, nausea, waking up in the middle of the night with gagging and the excessive salivation and sometimes vomiting. And I feel like those symptoms of acid reflux and GERD aren't really often talked about. Like we think about heartburn as kind of a main one, but there's there's a lot, it kind of runs the gamut. Sometimes there's coughing, post-nasal drip, gagging. And so it was super severe. And so I went on a PPI, but it wasn't really helping me at all. And so In in the beginning, I will say it helped, but then eventually, like, I wasn't seeing benefits from it, and I knew it wasn't really addressing the root cause, so I tried, honestly, everything. I tried excluding tons of foods. I tried going on the the reflux diets. I I tried low FODMAP, um, tons of different supplements, and what really helped me was you know, tuning out all of the misinformation. There's so much crazy information about acid reflux and and lots of fear mongering about PPIs. And what really helped me wean off of my PPI and get my symptoms under control was getting in enough nutrition. So, you know, acknowledging the acid reflux triggers in a thoughtful way, but really getting in enough nutrition and reversing nutrition deficiencies, like getting in balance so that my bowel movement started working again. My nervous system was more supported. Nervous system regulation was absolutely pivotal to, for me because, you know, research tells us that anxiety can play a really big role in our digestive function and acid reflux. And so getting my stress under control with gut directed meditation and yoga. And that's why I started my app Flora, because there's, there's a ton of tools there. Basically everything that helped me heal, I put into that app. And so using the mucilaginous herbs was really helpful in weaning off of the PPI, things like slippery elm, DGL, marshmallow root, but nervous system work, adequate nutrition, and um, as well as some strategic supplementation, that was really helpful in like really getting my health all together. Like you guys call it the unsexy basics, like the sleep, the nutrition, the stress, you got to do the unsexy basics. Yeah, it just kind of boils down to what does a human body need to be healthy, right? Like, it, we don't have to overcomplicate health. Oftentimes we do. And we want to think of like a SIBO specific diet or GERD specific diet. But we have this nice handy dandy list of all the vitamins and minerals and macros that the human body needs. And we know that the human body needs sleep and a somewhat functioning nervous system. We need relationships, right? Like, we can't all be in, in, self-created solitary confinement and just stay on our computers and think that that's the same thing. Like we are social creatures. That's another big one that's overlooked, but it sounds like you took a much more holistic approach and, and more of like, and I hope, I hope I don't offend the two dietitians in the room saying this, but almost like a nutrition 101 standpoint, right? Like not a GERD specific diet or a SIBO specific diet or an IBS specific diet. It was just like, Mm -hmm the stuff that you would learn in nutrition 101, am I getting vitamins? Am I getting minerals? Am I getting macros? Am I getting calories? Am I nourished? And it sounds like that was what ultimately helped you. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. See, look, you didn't and need love- the degree. 
<laughs> you don't need the RD to create. Just right. No, so like <laughs> what happens when we have digestive issues is like we get so confused about what to eat and we're looking for that food that's causing the symptom and really like we overanalyze nutrition and I've been there. Like it's it's understandable that we would do that and then we get so far from what is normal balanced eating. And so coming back to some of those you know, those basics can be powerful. And the connection piece, like you said, like we sometimes isolate ourselves and then our nervous system is not meant to be isolated. And so like connection and nutrition, Mm. those are fundamental. Well, and I I think the food piece too becomes isolating in and of itself. Like if you're Mm -hmm. so restricted, you don't want to go out to eat. You don't want to enjoy food with other people. And that gets really tricky too. And I, I have started thinking that, you know, everyone needs to take a nutrition first approach to digestive issues. If nutrition is inadequate, there's just no way of really building a resilient, happy, healthy gut. And it's just, it's so frustrating because you can get so lost in the weeds like you're describing where it's like, I just got to find that one food. And, um, you know, sometimes I find with my clients, it takes a complete reprogramming to move from a a mindset of finding the boogeyman in your diet versus actually focusing on how to nourish yourself. And I like that that was a, I like that you're highlighting that part of your story because it's such a problem for so many people that they just need to nourish their, themselves. And it's hard. Sometimes it's challenging if there is symptoms like the GERD, like bloating. I mean, we, we deal with maybe, um, you know, some of the typical IBS, like pain, bloating. But GERD in general, too, is, is the same way. If you're having tons of GERD, it can be more challenging to nourish yourself maybe than someone without GERD. But the, the focus should still be primarily on nutrition and then maybe some general personalized tweaking if there is like a trigger or something like that that's really bad that you might want to avoid too. But it tends to be the opposite where all of it comes down to doing this really um, intense reflux diet versus just nourishing your body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it makes logical sense to some degree. Like I just, I did a survey on my YouTube channel yesterday Um, Okay, so I'll start with, I did a survey two days ago, and basically said, what kind of topics would you like me to cover here on this channel? And I gave them the options, just picking kind of at random, candida, gut brain axis, vagus nerve sort of stuff, nutrition and supplements. And nutrition came in last, dead last. (laughs) So then yesterday, I did a follow up survey and said, whoa, I'm surprised that nutrition came in last. If you voted for something other than nutrition, can you tell me why that is? Like, tell me more about that. And uh, out of the options I gave, about 50% of people said that they didn't vote for nutrition because they can't add foods back in, they react. And Mm. it was that like, I'm stuck, I can't do it. These foods cause me symptoms. So this is a really common hurdle that our clients and our patients are facing, right? Like if 50% of my general YouTube audience is saying, I can't add foods back in because I react too too badly to them. And then we're over here preaching the importance of adding foods back in and getting adequate nutrition. It, it can feel very much like being stuck between a rock and a hard place for people. And I'm just curious, like, what what would you say to put you on the spot, our guest of honor, but what would you say to people who are like, I can't add foods back in. I react to everything. Gosh darn it. This sounds lovely, but no, I can't. This is something that I see all the time in in my practice, people coming to me with really, really restrictive diets because they feel that the food has caused the symptom and that they're reacting to a lot of foods. And I totally, you know, understand how frustrating it is to hear about veggie diversity and plant variety when you're having these symptoms. And I totally, I totally hear that. So I'm really glad you brought that up. I have this handout that I sometimes use that is, it's like a, um, a pie chart and showing that things that cause us symptoms. Like we often think that food is the only thing that's causing our symptoms. Like if we have a symptom after a food, it must be that food that has caused the symptom. But then there's this whole other, other pieces of the chart, other pieces of the puzzle that can cause symptoms. Like, you know, not 
chewing our food, um, not managing stress, having underlying, you know, functional issues that may be causing acid reflux or structural issues and, um, you know, not getting in enough overall nutrition, not hydrating, not sleeping. Like there's so many things that can also cause symptoms. Even if you have the symptom after the food, it's not always the food that's causing it. I'm so glad. I was actually going to ask if I could add something, and you kind of covered it already. But even if you are noticing the symptoms immediately after a food, and your nervous system is drawing that very logical conclusion, Mm -hmm. oh, I ate the food, and then shortly after I got the symptoms, therefore it must be the food. I think that we lose sight of all the different factors, all the different things on the pie chart that influence your ability to quote unquote, tolerate the food. So like you said, are, were you, were you eating that? Let's just, let's just do something laughable. That's going to make all of our listeners absolutely cringe. Um, Let's say you're eating a Twinkie, just to pick the most ludicrous thing. Let's say you're eating a Twinkie, but you're in really good company. You are on vacation. So you're super relaxed. You've been sitting on a beach, getting your vitamin D you've been just having the time of your life, you're really comfortable with the people you love most in the world, your toes are in the sand on that beach, and then you eat that Twinkie. That's going to be totally different versus if you haven't gotten good sleep in six months. If you're eating the Twinkie alone, or if you're eating the Twinkie with people that you hate and are draining the life out of you, or if you're eating it in the car on your way to work, or if you know you ate the Twinkie, but for the 15 meals prior to the Twinkie, you only ate Pop-Tarts and you're super nutrient deficient. Or if you eat the Twinkie in February and you're super vitamin D deficient and you haven't seen the sunlight in ages like your Dracula, like those things are gonna influence how your body tolerates that food in the moment. So it's not, it, it, I think actually of food reactions, people think of them as root causes, but it's not. It's like you have to get to the root of the root. Even if you say that your body's not tolerating a food, you have to ask, why would my body not tolerate that food, right? Exactly. Exactly, 100%. Yeah. One other thing I'll add, too, is with this, too, I mean, you might be coming from a place where you're like, oh, my God, I'm reacting to all these foods, and I know I'm reactive to some of these foods. The goal should always still be to get you nourished and to get you to a better place, so I think sometimes people view in their heads this diet that they want to do, which is so diverse and, but that feels so far away. So just taking some baby steps, maybe in the right direction. Don't, don't, um, throw the baby out with the bathwater. If you feel like you can't get to that hyper nutrient dense, super diverse diet right out the gate, the goal is more so just start experimenting, start somewhere try to get out of the rut that you're stuck in dietarily by throwing something new in. Um, even if you did something new each week, it started there and, you know, took a few bites of something. Just try, try and try. Just experiment a little bit and move from there. It doesn't have to be this drastic overnight change dietarily. So just throwing that out there too. Well, and you're touching on something we've talked about, which is that you need to be curious on this journey, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you observe something, instead of it turning into like panic mode, doom and gloom, oh my God, I'm doomed. And, and like, going that direction, just kind of having the approach of, huh, I wonder why that happened. Interesting Mm -hmm. observation. And then like, you play with something, you know, you continue to play with things. Um, I think also, In addition to being curious, I would say we're starting to get into like fixed mindset versus, I forget what the opposite would be, a non-fixed mindset, right? Like if you could be mentally flexible flexible and curious and kind of like roll with the punches for lack of a better word, I think that's going to, that's going to allow you to play with it. And then if you have something like we, so I had a student go through FODMAP Freedom in the spring and he was simultaneously working with you. And uh, Amy, that is. And I still remember he when he texted me and he was like, Oh, my God, I tried to eat yogurt. And like, he, he felt terrible for a couple of days. And he was a little bit freaked out. But it didn't deter him from experimenting. He was determined. And right. he was curious. And he, you know, he gave his, his body a little bit of time to heal. 
And then he revisited introducing foods. And now he's kicking butt and taking names. He's eating so many calories and so much fiber. He's going out to restaurants with a significant other. Like, he's doing great. Imagine, you know, he wouldn't have gotten to that place if he ate the yogurt, had a reaction, freaked the F out, and then just constructed his world and refused to try anything ever again. Like, you've got to persevere even through the difficult and kind of sticky stuff. With GERD, definitely mindset is super important. I think there's a ton of health anxiety that goes along with GERD because of the potential damage and and, and things like that. So it, it, the mindset is so important of, you know, staying calm because like we said, the nervous system plays a role. So I see this kind of negative feedback loop where stress may have exacerbated digestive symptoms and then the acid reflux is causing so much stress and anxiety. So we have to try to keep that in check. You know, I, I talk a lot about stress management, nervous system health with my clients because this can be one of the most pivotal pivotal changes in in someone's gut healing journey that allows them to then really start to slowly step by step reintroduce foods and do the things they need to do to take care of their health if you're so so anxious it's really hard to make those changes so we do a lot of you know nervous system work like the gut directed meditations on the flora app and um, whatever empties their cup like we've i've heard you guys talk about this in the past too like it doesn't have to necessarily be um, the traditional things like yoga breath work can be amazing and have been shown in research to help with ibs and acid reflux but it could also be just connecting with people and like doing things that help you feel safe in your body and help you connect. Yeah. Well, and, and even the diet stuff too creates more, more anxiety as well when Mm -hmm. you're just so hyper-focused on how you're reacting to each food. So the more you can let go and sort of say, you know, well, I'm going to try this and whatever happens, happens like, it's not the end of the world if I have a reaction, but just kind of letting go of some of the control. I do, or again, just acknowledging that there's a ri- there's there's a risk that you might have a reaction, but that's okay. Like in order to move forward, you have to kind of persevere. Like Nikki was talking about our mutual You'll get client, through it. right? So I mean, I I love that you're talking about the health anxiety piece, um, And I know you were saying that that was at play a bit in your own journey, like the anxiety aspect. And again, I I wish more providers acknowledged the anxiety piece too, because it's just so huge. I'm sure you see it all the time if people are engaging with more um, stress management that they just are going to make some progress uh, reflex-wise. And maybe it's not the whole thing. Maybe it's a part of their pie, but... You know, I think anxiety in general or poor stress management is going to be a part of most functional gut disorder pies, whether it's IBS or GERD. Mm -hmm. Totally. Like like you were saying, Nikki, the root of the root. Sometimes Mm -hmm. when people are eliminating a ton of foods, over-exercising, like, you know, having Googling constantly, um, having some of these even structural issues like um, from a nervous system perspective, that can change the way your digestive system functions structurally with the lower esophageal sphincter. So it's like that can be a really big root thing to approach is the nervous system health and anxiety. Yeah. Well, mm. the gut brain axis controls everything. We just came off of a couple of vagus nerve, gut brain axis, healthy nervous system kind of episodes that posted a few weeks ago, but your gut doesn't do a lot of things completely on its own. It does stuff when the nervous system tells it to. So Mm -hmm. you're right, like motility from all the way from the esophagus down to the first part of your colon, like that's all vagus nerve. And the rest of the colon is controlled by a different branch of the autonomic nervous system, but it's just not vagal. But if you think about motility, basically all the way through your gut, that's, that's part of that whether or not you secrete stomach acid and how much you secrete, whether or not your goblet cells are secreting mucus to protect your gut lining, whether or not you're healing the gut lining, aka leaky gut, if you're healing that, are you secreting digestive enzymes? Are you secreting bile? Are you producing bile? Is your immune system in your gut inflamed or not inflamed? A lot of these things are directly affected by vagus nerve activity or gut brain axis activity. 
So yeah, it's, it's like this huge, huge piece of the puzzle that people are oftentimes reluctant to go down and really explore. You know, I think a lot of people just want like the supplement or the essential oil that's magically going to tone their vagus nerve. And that's not how it works. We we have to navigate this tricky thing called human life. And there's just all that that's all there is to it. Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. And and that's exactly why I think, you know, having tools in your back pocket is so, so essential. So like thinking about like even making a list of things that help you manage stress. And if you don't know what that is, exploring that for yourself, exploring the Flora app, there's like, there's a risk-free seven day trial. If you just want to go check it out for no cost at all, like ex- examining, are these tools going to be helpful for you in reducing your stress? You know, is it getting out in nature? Um, is it, you know, trying to tune out some of that missing, some of the noise and the, the Googling really trying not to, you know, do things that exacerbate your anxiety as well. Yeah. And, and I love, okay. So we're starting from the unsexy basics. So if people feel like they're starting to incorporate more foods and maybe they're having some problems with that process or they need some additional support, What would be like the next layer you would say after they've worked on some of the stress or they're, they're working on the stress, they're working on their nutrition. Um, you know, they're working on movement. They're kind of incorporating the unsexy basics. Are there some favorite things that you like, um, to implement at that point or any, um, refining type strategies that might help with tolerance as they're trying to increase foods or get them over humps. Um, anything in particular that you like a lot for GERD, which it could depend on the person. I think a lot of the unsexy basics could take care of the GERD in and of itself, but you might want to have some support along the way to help with symptom management. But are there any favorite symptom management things as you're working on the GERD or even, even root causal interventions too that you like that might be a little bit of an extra layer outside the unsexy basics with a lot of my patients i'm using the mucilaginous herbs to get some of that inflammation to go down because every time we reflux we are irritating that tissue and again and again and so we have to start calming that tissue and providing a little bit more of a barrier. So the mucilaginous herbs like slippery elm, DGL, marshmallow root, those can help to create a thicker mucus lining in the esophagus in the throat. And that's really, really helpful in preventing that irritation. I also have found melatonin to be a low dose, like three to five milligrams to be really helpful in a lot of my clients with the reflux at night, you know, doing an elevated bed or putting Something underneath the bed posts of the upper side of the bed can be really helpful. Um, in addition to those, I think we're making sure that we're replenishing our B12, zinc, making sure we're getting enough iron food sources, um, and also vitamin D and calcium. Usually looking for those sources of calcium and iron through food, and then potentially adding in a you know a multivitamin um, for the B vitamins has been really helpful as well for improving tolerance. Cool. Yeah, I like I like all that. Um... I like all those strategies. I'm curious too, like with the musa, I never know how to pronounce it. The mucus supporting herbs. Do you, um, do you typically do like teas or powders? Cause I know like sometimes they come in the form of capsules and I'm always just like, well, if you have reflux, does it help more to have the coating of the powder? I always assume so, but I don't work extensively with reflux as you do. Um, so I was just curious, do you feel the powder helps a lot more? I, I'd imagine so, or teas or something that does coat like some versus, sort of liquid application. Right. Versus the absolutely. capsules. I f- okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm moving away from using a lot of capsules with the mucilaginous mm-hmm. herbs or really anything like, because a lot of the clients that I'm seeing are, you know, having trouble digesting 
I try not to recommend capsules at all. Like I just want to take that piece out of it in terms of, and I see some people who come to me are taking tons of supplements. It's like they're nauseous. It's like, it's probably because you're digesting like all of these capsules. And so definitely, you know, with Slippery Elm, love it in the powder form. I find that to be the most effective in the powder form, adding that to hot water and, you know, allowing that to cool before you drink it. Getting that tissue contact is super important. I think, I think it works much better than the capsule. For DGL, I really think there's something to chewing it, mixing with the saliva. I think that there's, you know, some sort of activation that is happening. Um, I think it works much better that way, even even more so than in a powder. So I like I like mm. chewing for chewable tablets for the DGL, and um, for things like you know melatonin and. Um, that is, you can get it in a dissolvable. A lot of people with GERD struggle with pill swallowing and feeling like things are stuck in their throat. So a dissolvable form could be really helpful. And things like magnesium, if you struggle with constipation, I love it in the powder form. Magnesium citrate, I usually recommend in a powder. I've never, I never recommend magnesium. Usually as a, as a, capsule, uh, I just find that it, it, it can be really helpful as a powder, um, for people with GERD specifically and constipation. I will share though. A, I hate the taste of magnesium citrate <laughs> so much. Um, I just personally don't like, I don't like the taste of licorice either though. So I don't know, maybe I'm weird, but um, I will say, I think that if you're somebody like me who doesn't like the taste of the powdered versions, you could potentially do a magnesium capsule. Right. Yes, um, it's, yeah, it, you know, it's, I think the key that you're, you're saying is that we don't want you to get to this place where you're your poor body is having to digest and break mm. down like 30 cellulose <laughs> capsules and gel caps a day because that is like, well, you're complaining of digestive problems, but you're digesting this hunk of cellulose and that's right. probably not helpful versus, you know, if you rely more on food and liquid based formulations and then you have like maybe one or two capsules here or there, I think mm -hmm. that's much more practical. Um, but totally. I will say too, I don't know if you've seen this, but I wanted to share while it's top of mind. I've seen a couple of cases, I think all of them have been, it's come up during our FODMAP Freedom Q&As, but I've had a couple of people who had reflux or gastritis symptoms, and I brought up, hey, maybe it's the magnesium citrate you're taking, why don't you try cutting that out for a bit? And a couple of people have observed that magnesium citrate specifically gives them more like reflux gastritis sort of stuff. But if they switch to like a glycinate or a different form of magnesium that they tolerate that much better. I don't know if you've observed that too, but I've seen that happen a couple of times with people. Yes, I have. I have. And especially um, some people are really sensitive to citric acid if there's citric acid in the in the magnesium. So they may have tried magnesium before and had a really bad experience if, if they are sensitive to magnesium citrate. Um, and if there was a citric acid, definitely, you know, everyone's individual. I would say it's like super important to get supplement recommendations personalized, as I'm sure we all, all agree, but definitely a thing that can be be sensitive. So exploring with gut magnesium glycinate is helpful for sure in those situations. She's going up. She's going I up. Am. But that was your cue to talk to the, our guest while I'm I going know. up so I can stay muted. I know. I'm sorry. I, Throwing off I, the rhythm here. I know. I always just like to comment when Nikki goes up in her... <laughs> um, I didn't do yeah. my dramatic, like... I know. You know Usually she does it. like it with flair. Um yeah, and and I would say too, for the piece, do you feel like GERD and gastritis run together? I know Nikki just mentioned gastritis. They're not always together. Um, Part of it is I forget which these particular individuals were struggling with. I just have right. some recollection that it was like upper GI irritation and burning. I forget right. though if it if they don't, I think that both the two that I'm thinking of off the top of my head, I think both had gastritis, but I could be wrong. That would make sense if they're sensitive, more sensitive to magnesium citrate. But yeah, I, I would love to hear any nuancy differences that you like to use with your gastritis versus straight GERD patients. Um, I'd like to sort of hear the, the different elements of you. Do you have something else to add, Nikki? Yeah, well, I'd, I think what sort of what sort of differences do you see or what sort of treatment approach might you take with one versus the other? But also, mm -hmm. you know, thinking of our listeners, 
if somebody had symptoms and they weren't sure if it was reflux or gastritis, like, is there a way to tell the difference somewhat based off of symptoms? I know ultimately you would want to get a scope and then they would be able to tell you Mm. what things look like on the inside, but is there any like indicator or symptom difference between GERD or gastritis? And yeah, what, what sort of stuff would you think of for gastritis kind of transitioning into that conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, do you have something, Amy? Oh, no, I thought you were raising your hand. Sorry. Um, Yeah, absolutely. So with, you know, most of my patients come to me already having endoscopies, at least at least one. And so that's really helpful in in determining gastritis versus GERD. I do see them coinciding, but not always. A lot of people come to me also with endoscopies that have showed absolutely nothing. They could have really severe GERD symptoms, but no sign of irritation, no sign Mm. of any gastritis. And that's really sometimes invalidating to people. So if anyone's listening that has had a clear endoscopy or other tests, like it, it's sometimes very frustrating, but it's so common. I would say like most of my clients with reflux have a negative, like no H. pylori, no nothing going on in their endoscopy. And in terms of gastritis, I do do some of the same things in terms of mucilaginous herbs, stomach lining support, reversing nutrition deficiencies. I see a lot of pain, nausea, gurgling, feeling like you're really hung- like you're really hungry after you eat. It's like this weird hunger pain. I get that symptom described to me a lot um, with gastritis. And so a few things in terms of gastritis is really, of course, understanding the root cause. Like, is this, you know, gut imbalance? Is H. pylori present? Is there some sort of bile reflux going on? Um, physical stress is also a big one I see with gastritis is like, have you had a big physical stress or emotional stress or trauma that's something that may have weakened the stomach lining. And so thinking about that also autoimmune gastritis, you know, could, could be at play, but in terms of how I manage this with my clients is all of the things that I've mentioned, but also Finding a meal schedule sometimes is really, it sounds really simple, but that has been really helpful for some of my clients with severe GERD and gastritis. So really developing a schedule so that we're not under eating and not overeating. With GERD, with hernias, with lower esophageal sphincter issues, we want to make sure that we're not overfilling the stomach or filling too quickly. And so we talk a lot about mealtime hygiene, like really chewing our food, taking some of that work out of the, the stomach, especially if you, if you get, have gastritis, we want to make things easier for the stomach. So, mm. you know, having a flexible meal schedule that allows for you to get the nutrients that you need and like easy to digest foods too. Like we talk a lot about like cooking, the way that we'll cook our veggies, soups and stews. Um, that's sometimes individual. Sometimes people with GERD don't do well with a lot of liquid at one time. So um, it's it's kind of a case by case basis, but depending on, depending on the root cause, sometimes those soups and stews, easy to digest things can be really, really helpful while the stomach is irritated and that's I didn't name any of the like common you know common irritants of gastritis and acid reflux because a lot of people come to me already being really aware of those but yeah one one thing I'll add to for the gastritis something that I've found that have helped my gastritis people which so many people with SIBO and IBS struggle with gastritis. It's it's a bit mind blowing in my mind because a lot of them come to us not thinking about gastritis or not thinking gastritis is a problem for them. They think it's just the SIBO. But then when we get into looking at their endoscopy or truly examining their symptoms, we can kind of see there is definitely more of an upper GI slant that warrants more work versus just diving down to the microbiome stuff um, or again, lower, slightly lower GI stuff like in the small intestines or the large intestines. But um, one thing I will say, a lot of people that are under eating, which I know we've already talked about or not getting enough protein, I feel has a huge impact on whether someone with gastritis heals. So I've had some clients really struggling to repair their gastritis and to me, again, you need fuel to get into an anabolic state to rebuild. So that's another thing. If you're someone that's had pretty chronic gastritis, I would just assess 
overall nutrition, but in particular overall nutrition and protein, because you're going to need some protein to help rebuild the stomach lining. Um, and beyond what maybe an average person might need that doesn't have gastritis, you might need more um, for healing tissue like that. So just wanted to throw that out there because I, I don't think it's discussed very much in the gastritis space, and I found it to be pretty important. Well, and I know we talked about this with a guest a while back. Was it Kayla or Kyla? Who, um, Kay- Kaylee McDivitt? Kaylee, yeah. Yep. Remember, I remember she was saying that she wants her clients to shoot for, I think, roughly about 100 grams of protein a day, mm-hmm. which is genuinely pretty challenging to do. I mean, I eat meat, I eat beans and hummus and lentils and nuts. And I'm very omnivorous. And I still don't quit quite hit that metric on a day to day basis, I kind of range from like 80 to 100, depending on the day. So it can be genuinely challenging to get to and you really might not be hitting the mark or even close to that mark if you've never done nutritional tracking or worked with a dietitian before. Yeah, absolutely. Protein is huge. I talk about protein with my clients all the time in terms of, you know, gastritis, healing, getting enough protein to produce enough digestive enzymes, produce enough stomach acid. And also just, I have, you know, clients really sometimes can struggle to get in enough nutrition at mealtimes and they're feeling very hungry after meals. And then sometimes that can lead to grazing kind of all day. And with SIBO, with gastritis, with acid reflux, like we really do kind of want to have that space in between meals. And so making sure our meals are nourishing and satiating enough, protein is a super satiating nutrient. So exploring that. Well, and you just hit on something that I was going to ask next, which is, you mentioned that you don't ever want to overfill the stomach with this sort of stuff. Do you find that this is a crowd where like six small meals a day makes sense? Or because you want to have a little bit of time in between meals for the MMC and all of that stuff? Do you think that it's more of three square meals? Or is there? Is it more of a case by case basis? Do you think that there's any sort of rough template that you could say as far as how many meals or how frequently meals should be? It's, it's definitely individual, but I would say what has worked well for a lot of my clients is the three meals and one snack and really working on the nutrition within those meals. Having space in between your meals is really important for the migrating motor complex, like you said, so we can move things through the GI tract, you know, in, in terms of constipation and um, it just proper gut function, we don't always want to be constantly eating. That can really be be difficult to make progress with GERD if we are grazing throughout the day. That being said, it can be really hard for people with GERD to get in enough nutrition at mealtime. So we're working step by step to increase the nutrition at their meals and in a way that's tolerable for them. And I think, you know, everyone is different. Some people in the beginning, if they're really struggling with GERD, they may need three meals, two snacks. Um, It could, it kind of differs case by case, but definitely having, you know, three to four hours in between your meals, I think has what what I have seen work, work really well, making sure that those meals are, are nutrient dense can also help you. Uh, have that four hour time window where you're, you're feeling good. Blood sugar is stable, which is another big thing with, with digestive health, it's blood sugar, of course. And so that's where protein can come in and healthy fats. And, and as an added bonus, like they have, they have um, a lot of healthy fats and proteins will give us zinc and B12 and important nutrients for, for people with GERD. Yeah. I like that you, um, that you're talking about the nuance here because it's similar to what I think I do most of the time with clients. Like probably ideal is having some, some fasting between meals, but at the same time, now if someone can't get nourished with having some fasting that I probably would prioritize nourishing first and then move towards maybe a three meal structure, a three meal and a snack structure. Um, so I like that you're talking about the nuance there and, and you do a similar thing, I think that I do, which is, I kind of know that having some fasting is optimal, but you have to meet someone where they're at. So if you're someone that's nowhere near three meals, one snack, like you said, just sort of first, maybe assessing nutrition and then working on meal patterns from that point might be a good place to start. 
Absolutely. And I see a lot of people who are in eating disorder recovery as well. And if you're Mm. recovering from an eating disorder or a period of time where you were underweight and your body needs to restore some of that weight, which by the way, is really important. You know, estrogen plays a huge role in our overall health and our digestion. And I see this a lot with people recovering from restrictive eating disorders is GERD and acid reflux. And so during those periods, your body may be asked, asking for more nutrition. And so you may be hungrier than normal and it can be really challenging symptom wise to increase your nutrition when you're dealing with these GI issues. And so, um, it's, you know, working one-on-one with someone is super, super helpful there, but, but also in, in honoring that hunger. And if you, if your body is, is still hungry, asking for more nutrition, then it's important to, to listen to that. And there may be some things in the beginning. If you're, if you are recovering from an eating disorder, more frequent snacks, maybe, maybe more helpful for you Mm. if you're not tolerating those larger meals. Yeah. I, I like that you bring up the eating disorder thing too. And just one thing I've noticed, I don't know if you see this too, but I definitely have noticed that sometimes it takes people getting up to their almost their set point weight or the weight that they like being at, which could vary again, based on the body type and the person. But if you had a body weight that you felt your best and you'd lost 20 pounds or something, and maybe it was eating disorder related, it might take getting you back to that weight or pretty close to that weight for you to feel your most best or your best. Most best is not a, not a expression. Feel your best. So, um, Again, I, that's something to think about too. Sometimes I'll have clients and say, well, I'm gaining and uh, I'll encourage them. That's amazing that you're gaining, but you still might need to get up to a weight where your metabolism and your hormones are all firing on all cylinders and you might just not quite be at that point yet. So again, I love that you bring up the eating disorder piece of it because I do think working on getting to a stable weight where your body feels safe in your body, which I know you mentioned earlier, like your body needs to feel safe um, for metabolism and hormones to be optimal. And that might take some work um, and some time of replenishing if you've been depleted. Well, yeah, especially sometimes we see people who have lost 20, 30, 40 pounds right. because of their gut struggle. And it's it, it's sometimes tricky to talk about this and rationalize it and kind of prove the point to people and convince them that this is a big deal because sometimes we'll get the argument of, well, I was a I was a normal good weight, and then I developed my gut problems. So like obviously the weight loss didn't cause the gut problems, right? And they're like, well, and then I lost the weight because of the gut problem, and it's. I, we were just talking about this on Marco Polo the other day, Amy, right? Mm-hmm. There are root causes that we're always thinking about, but usually people make this mistake where they talk about root causes and they focus on root causes, but what they're actually thinking about is triggers. So it's like, what was the thing that shoved you off the cliff? What was the thing that took you from feeling pretty decent to no longer feeling decent? food poisoning, antibiotics, super stressful thing, childbirth, whatever it might be. But the reality is that our bodies are dealing with a lot of crap all the time. Maybe your body was dealing with the breast implants or the toxicity or the crummy microbiome or the stress or the trauma or the poor sleep or the weight issues or the whatever. Like maybe your body was coping with all of that reasonably well And then the trigger that you're really looking at was just the straw that broke the camel's back. It doesn't mean that those other straws are irrelevant, right? Because like the, the antibiotic straw might not have broken the camel's back if the camel didn't have 500 other straws on its freaking back at the time. So we still need to think about these other things. But yeah, this, this comes up all the time. And we were just talking about that the other day. Mm. Um, At the risk of Huh? I said 100%. Oh, okay. Uh, Can I potentially derail us? Because I know we need to wrap up in the next few minutes here and be mindful of our guests' time. Um, I'm going to go back like five or 10 minutes because it took me a minute to find this paper. So going back to the blood sugar 
thing. And I think this came up in the context of like having a little bit of space between meals. So first off, we've talked about this on the podcast, and I just did a YouTube video not that long ago about this topic. If you struggle with low blood sugar, hypoglycemia type stuff, and you feel woozy or headachey or lightheaded or hangry or just blah when you don't eat frequently, in my opinion and my observation, you have to prioritize the blood sugar before you worry about the MMC. And I say mm. that in part because I healed my gut and I'm pretty sure had I done a breath test, I think I would have been told I had SIBO back in the day. I had a lot of the same symptoms that our listeners struggle with. And I didn't know about the MMC. Nobody knew about the MMC. I mean, hardly anybody at least. And I was able to heal my gut while still eating six small meals a day and not even being aware of the MMC. So in my experience, in my observation, I think blood sugar is most important. But also, let's wrap this back up with a nice little bow and bring it back to the mindset thing. There's a really cool study that I came across a while back. So it is called blood sugar level follows perceived time rather than actual time in people with type 2 diabetes. So this is a, let's see, 2016 paper. Basically, what they did was they took a group of 46 people with type 2 diabetes and uh, I think if I remember correctly, they maybe gave them a meal and then they observed their blood sugar response, but they messed with the clocks in the room. And I think they had the people watching TV or doing something or reading a book. They screwed with the clocks. So there was one group who actually, you know, was seeing the real time go by. There was another group where the clock was sped up. And there was another clock where the clock was much slower than it actually was. And they said, participants, hold on, uh, changes in blood glucose levels were measured in 46 participants with diabetes while they completed simple tasks during a 90 minute period. Pa participants' perception of time was manipulated by having them refer to clocks that were either accurate or altered to run fast or slow. Blood glucose levels changed in accordance with how much time they believed passed instead of how much actual time had passed. These results are an example of the influence of psychological processes that it can directly exert on the human body. Holy macaroni, what a cool study. They messed with the clocks and then it changed their blood sugar response. What are we doing to ourselves? <laughs> we know nothing. <laughs> so cool. So if you think you are going to have a blood sugar issue, or if you think that you're going to react to that high histamine mm. food or that high FODMAP food or that high whatever food, you're probably right. But if you mm. can go into eating with, with, I don't know, like, I don't know what I'm trying to say. If you More can chill a just a little bit. Willy nilly out of attitude. Well, I don't know about willy nilly, but if you can chill just a bit <laughs> and not freak out about all of the possibilities that maybe could happen, you will probably see symptomatic benefit from that. And there are many studies where they do this, where they mess with our perception of the world and then they measure stuff in the body. There's another one with milkshakes and ghrelin and people's hunger hormone and so and I'm trying to think which hormone they measured. Well, anyway, their, their perceived satiety and their measurable like blood levels of the satiety hormone were drastically changed whether they believed that they ate a really high calorie indulgent milkshake or a low calorie sensible milkshake, but it was the same damn milkshake both times. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. Do totally, any of you guys I, want to bring this home? Because I'm just losing my mind over here. I have seen crazy research about, you know, placebo taking a pill. They were people were told that it was going to make their hair fall out, and their it was it was a sugar pill, and their hair actually <laughs> fell out. So, oh. if you're interested in this stuff, there's a book called Mind Over Medicine, which I think the title is a little bit problematic, but it's a really interesting book about the placebo effect and. One of the first things I say in a client in a session with someone with GERD who has a lot of food anxiety, because food anxiety with GERD is really common. I'll I'll talk about it's like it's really important for you to know that food is absolutely essential for your healing journey, and food is not the enemy, and there are foods that are going to help you recover from GERD. Because with GERD, there's so much focus on can't eat this, can't eat that. And it's like all the most delicious things that you can't eat and food is not safe and it starts to feel not safe. And so with that, I think you're completely right, Nikki, like 
whether you go into a food situation knowing that food is healing for your body or or anticipating that food is going to give you symptoms, that will really dictate what happens at that meal. Yeah, I, I almost think it's like a fake it till you make it scenario to go in with a little bit more confidence or again, do it a little bit scared, however you want to view it, but just kind of go in and again, know that food is essential and you have to push through somewhat some of the fears, which it's hard. It's not an easy thing as someone that struggles with anxiety myself, the, the, the treatment for anxiety a little bit is just letting go and doing things that make you a little bit scared. It's like, yeah. it's so simple, but yet so challenging at the same time. Uh. Yeah. Well, and I even, I, I saw something recently. Um, I think that it, something to the effect of procrastination is the unwillingness to deal with uncomfortable feelings or sensations or thoughts. And I yep. was like, Oh, and that struck a nerve for me because my big thing, I don't, I've shared, I don't think I struggle with anxiety normally, but I go through periods where I'm genuinely very scared to open my email inbox because I've convinced myself that there's going to be some like irate customer or some person who's critical of one of my YouTube videos and just rah, hating on me. And I've, I've, known that that's silly. I don't get that many genuinely bad emails, but I convinced myself that there's a boogeyman. But when I, you know, I read that and that kind of struck a chord because I was like, yeah, I'm just, I'm procrastinating because I have to open the inbox eventually, right? Like you have to try the new food eventually, unless you intend to eat this way until the last days you're on earth. Like you're going to do it eventually. You're just procrastinating at the end of the day. And it's, we're unwilling to be comfortable, un unwilling to be uncomfortable if that makes sense. And we have to kind of embrace the discomfort if we want to overcome these challenges and, and become more resilient. So easier said mm -hmm. than done, perhaps, but I think there's truth in that statement. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me ask, let me ask this, Molly, as we wrap up and be mindful of your time. Um, can you let the good people know a where they could find you on Instagram and B? Uh, just can you tell us for like a minute or two about your app, Flora? Yeah, absolutely. So on Instagram, I'd love to connect with you at mollypelletier.rd. Uh, on TikTok, mollypelletier.rd. I, I post tips about acid reflux daily on both of those platforms. And then also on YouTube, ton of information on YouTube. That's mollypelletier.rd as well. And I created Flora for people who were, you know, in a very similar position as I was with the GERD, with acid reflux, anxiety, because I felt very misunderstood by, you know, conventional medicine. And I think we hear all the time we need to manage anxiety and we need to get in enough nutrition, but how do you actually do that? And so there's step-by-step -step healing modules on Flora that help bring you to a place of really feeling confident in your nutrition and, and knowing about acid reflux and, uh, you know, the way, the factors that can impact acid reflux. And then there's tons of gut directed meditations. I'm also a 500 hour registered yoga and meditation instructor. So the mind body connection has always been like at the forefront of my philosophy, but with, with Flora, you can access these gut-directed meditations. There's five minutes, there's 10 minutes, and then there's yoga that's safe for acid reflux. So there's yoga that's no downward dog, no forward folds, things that you know are really acid reflux friendly. And so both of those tools can be extremely helpful in decreasing anxiety, shifting your mindset, and really, really catalyzing your gut healing journey. So that app, you can find that on my website, which is just mollypelletier.com. It's also in the link in my bio and all my platforms. Cool. I can't, I need to dive into the floor app. I poked around a little bit. It's, it's a beautifully created. Like it's very visually appealing also, which my artsy fartsy brain got a kick out of and appreciated, but it looks like it's jam packed with a lot of really good information. Um, Thank you. And again, like, you know, I know that there's some yoga sessions I think I saw in there and some meditation sessions. Right. Like you said, yeah. kind so, of a one-stop shop. 
a lot of people who you know are struggling with GERD are feeling really isolated and and I wanted there to be some community aspect so we have the live yoga and live meditations and um, you can ask me questions as well right in the app and I answer them in a in a video Q&A every week and that's a really nice way to connect and get your questions answered uh, by a dietitian at a, at a much lower price point than than working with a dietitian so um, yeah there's a, like I said there's there's a seven day free trial so you can just go check it out and would love to hear your thoughts about it yeah awesome well guys I think that's a wrap like I said we're going to be respectful and mindful of our our guests time but round of applause thank you so much for having me this is great oh sorry round of applause there you go there you go (laughs) this was great thank you so much it was an absolute pleasure and we will have to have you on for a third episode before you know it (laughs) So thank you so much for your time. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. You heard the woman. You could find her at mollypelletier.rd on Instagram. As always, I'm at gut.microbiome.queen on Instagram. And Amy is amy underscore hollenkamp underscore rd on Instagram. So come find us. We're all over the internet. We're not hard to find. And we will see you right back here on the next episode of the IBS Freedom Podcast.